Okay, everybody, welcome to uh, uh, our webinar today with Dr. Brian Silliman, um, Harnessing Biological Partnerships to Improve Coastal Restoration. Um, we really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, I am Emily Knight. I am man a manager with the Lenfest Ocean Program. For those of you that do not know us, the Lenfest Ocean Program is a grant-making program that funds research projects and expert working groups to address priority science needs facing ocean and coastal decision makers. To learn more, visit us at lenfestocean.org, where you can also sign up for our newsletter and follow us at Lenfest Ocean on Twitter to get all the updates. So for today's agenda, we are really excited to have Dr. Brian Silliman. He is Professor of Marine Conservation Biology at Duke University. And also, thank you so much, Brian, for being willing to do this. Uh, Brian is in, currently in Australia on a Fulbright, and so it is 5.30 a.m. tomorrow, his time. <laughs> so we really, really appreciate you talking to us today. Um, today, Brian's going to discuss a research topic that he's been involved in for many years now, which is how positive interactions between species can boost ecosystem recovery and resilience. And then he is also going to discuss his new Lenfest project, where he and his, ta his team aim to take that knowledge and test it and integrate it into coastal restoration design and practice. This project has the potential to be a game changer. First, as Brian will explain, there is evidence that incorporating positive species interactions into restoration design could significantly improve yields and cut costs. Second, to test this in the real world decision making context, Brian is collaborating with researchers, coastal managers, and restoration practitioners from sites all over the world from the very outset of the project to ensure his methods and his outputs are relevant and useful. And those growing relationships alone set us on a much stronger path for helping managers get the most out of this field. So a couple of webinar logistics before I pass it over to Brian. Uh, we have all the attendees muted. Uh, this is to prevent feedback or echoes. Um, we will take questions in the last 20 to 25 minutes of the webinar. Use the Q&A panel to type and submit your question at any point during the webinar. We will keep track of the queue and I will read it aloud at the end for Brian to answer. Also, when you submit your question, be sure to submit it to all panelists, not just the host. So uh, we can see it and, and, and make sure Brian hears it. Depending on how many questions there are, we may not get to them all, but we really welcome folks to reach out and follow up with Brian and or us at LenFest. So for next steps, we are recording this webinar. In the next couple weeks, we will make that recording and video of the PowerPoint available online, and I will distribute that link via email. Um, I have a running distribution list for information about this project. If you are not on that, or unsure if you're on it and would like to be, just send me a note. So I am now going to turn it over to you, Brian. Uh, okay. Um, I'm an ecologist and I use experiments to unravel key species interactions that regulate ecosystem structure and resilience. And currently, um, I'm not only a professor with Duke University, but a grantee of the Lindfest Foundation and a Fulbright Scholar. And what we're looking at presently with experiments is the role of po positive interactions in the regrowth of ecosystems um, during restoration process. And that'll be the subject of my talk today. Emily, is this flashing back and forth between presenter mode? Right, not right now. Okay, well, I'll continue. It does on my screen, but I'll just go with it. Okay. So um, I'd like to start my talk today with a story about how I came up with this idea that biological partnerships and positive species interactions could be really important for the restoration of ecosystems. And um, that story is, uh, is a study I did almost 15 years ago in Chile. I went down there with Mark Bertness and um, Jose Farina, and we wanted to ask the simple question, 
um, whether organisms were more likely to cooperate or compete with their neighbors, in this case, the organisms would be plants, along a stress gradient. So we went down to the salt marsh in Chile, and in the salt marsh, we planted plants along a stress gradient from inundation stress from high to low stress, and we planted them with and without neighbors. So we set up the experiment, and we went back to the United States, and Jose called us up um, not long after he said, you're not going to believe what happened. I thought that cows had come in and eaten it, but in, indeed, a tsunami had come by and it overwashed the salt marsh. And we went down to check it out, flew down right away, and what we found was really surprising in that the plants, the only plants to survive were those that were planted near neighbors, independent of where they were in the stress gradient. And so when the stressful event came by, we found that plants that were planted without neighbors couldn't survive, and those that one, the ones that did have neighbors, especially the ones in the middle, were protected from the erosion and they persisted over this minor tsunami. It, it put about six inches of sediment on the salt marsh. And from that, I started talking to Mark. I said, this, this is an interesting result. Maybe this could really affect um, the success of restoration projects. Incorporating positive interactions just a simple planting design may change the trajectory of a restoration project. So that gave me the idea to think about uh, doing experiments to test this idea and to move forward with the potential for positive interactions by design and restoration to make a big difference. I'd like to start out with um, uh, recognition of that this project is, is a giant collaboration between many members of, of my lab, as well as the um, uh, managers and scientists on sites. In many ways, I'm just a facilitator uh, working in collaboration and uh, helping to design these projects to test the questions of whether or not positive interactions can really help out these restoration designs and increase yields. And it's not just my lab, it's scientists all over the world and managers in California, North Carolina, China, and the Netherlands. And in many cases, for instance, in California, these projects are, are spearheaded by those scientists like uh, Dr. Kirsten Lawson and uh, Monique Fountain, uh, and then a member of my lab will be collaborating with them. So this is a giant collaboration in the Netherlands. Joseph van der Heide is leading this effort and we're collaborating with them. So in, in discussing today, there are four sort of uh, main ideas that we're, that we're gonna present today. First is how positive interactions are essential to marine ecosystem biodiversity, um, its persistence in the face of climate change, and also recovery rates and restoration. So that'll be the majority of the talk. And another theme will be the, my proposal that we should have a new conservation and restoration paradigm in marine so systems. And we should not only systematically deal with physical stresses or negative interactions, but we need to systematically harness positive ones. This would be a paradigm expansion for all marine conservation and restoration. Um, and then I'll go over the new project to test positive interactions under various, um, various environmental conditions and integrate with restoration practice. Those are the ones I have going with the LinFest and suggest to you the results so far that the like result of, of changing our designs and taking advantage of positive interactions that naturally occur in ecosystems will lower cost and enhance our success. So the goals of conservation, whether you're wet or you're dry, are to identify a target um, uh, for conservation. It could be a function, it could be a population, it could be a community um, or a function, and to stabilize its loss and then hopefully increase it over time. In marine systems, marine conservation, the paradigm and the theory around that in many ways was taken from terrestrial systems which had a head start on us. Uh, and in the 40s and 50s, in many ways, the terrestrial idea about what to do in order to conserve a target population, community, or function, uh, we took those other ideas and got those wet. For instance, with restoration, the idea was to avoid competition and to do tree-style plantings with wetland mangroves or wetland salt marshes. And if you do a quick summary of what the marine conservation paradigm is, it's that first managers, of course, identify this target for conservation, then we reduce Think about all the physical stressors, systematically list those, and think about how we can reduce those stressors on the environment. We also think about reducing human impacts via protected areas and management and policy. Uh, and then we also think about suppressing negative species interactions, competition, invasions. And so if you put all those together, what we do is we systematically identify in these meetings initially for ways to uh, help this target 
to identify and avoid negative interactions. Um, but we all know from our ecosystems, whether you're in coral reefs or mangroves or salt marshes or oyster reefs, that there are strong positive interactions uh, in addition to these negative forces that affect the success of our ecosystem. Here's a picture in North Carolina of an oyster reef right in front of a salt marsh. This oyster reef, the salt marsh could not exist without the oyster reef. The oyster reef baffles waves from coming in. And once that oyster reef is removed, for instance, because of harvesting, an edge, an erosive edge will form at the, um, at the marsh uh, boundary. That will then begin a retreat. And then over time, you'll lose 50 or 100 meters of your marsh and the marsh will almost disappear into a pocket marsh. And it's this type of uh, positive interaction that we want to think about systematically in our systems. And to do that, I'm going to do a basic review of positive interactions that occur in ecology here on this slide. And we know that there are direct facilitations. For instance, where A can facilitate B, just like the oysters facilitate the Spartina marshes. Okay. Yeah. An oyster reef could also facilitate many species. For instance, C could facilitate D, E, and F. And there also can be feedbacks in that situation. So A could facilitate B, but for instance, the Spartina grass could facilitate A, and then we have a mutualism. And there also can be strong positive interactions generated by multiple species or networks of interactions. For instance, double negative interactions which occur in organisms, for instance, in regulating our own insulin. Uh, insulin that goes through our bodies and it's, it's not released because there's a suppressor always going on. And when our body wants insulin, it releases a su suppressor of the suppressor. So a double negative interaction generates insulin. We have that in ecology too, through trophic cascades and other examples I give, where A suppresses B, B suppresses C, and therefore A facilitates C. Strong interactions that, that could be harnessed. And we also now recognize that double positive interactions can lead to synergistic positive interactions between A and C in those interactions. And these aren't just close, uptight interactions. They can happen over large um, distances. And for instance, and this is analogous to the oyster reef spartine interaction, but coral reefs can facilitate mangroves. And they can do that by, again, dissipating waves like oysters do for salt marshes. And mangroves can facilitate coral reefs by mitigating harmful effects of sedimentation and absorbing nutrients that otherwise would fuel algal overgrowth in that system. So we need to think about positive interactions at a local scale and also at a much larger scale as well. So all these different types of positive interactions are critical for marine ecosystem structure and resilience. And I'm gonna, everybody has an example of a positive interaction in your coral reef, in your seagrass, that's critical for its success. And many times they're haphazardly incorporated into uh, restoration plans. Uh, for instance, in coral reefs, there's not usually a marine conservation or restoration plan for coral reefs that doesn't think about the positive effects of herbivores. What I'm talking about is listing all of the positive interactions that could possibly occur for corals and incorporating as many of those as we can. And I'm going to give you a couple examples from my research about how important these positive interactions can be for ecosystem recovery uh, in systems hit by a lot of stress. The first example I'll give you is from the rocky shores of Patagonia. And one of the classic stories of marine ecology is that biodiversity on rocky shores is regulated by keystone predation. Bob Payne came up with this idea and, and experimental evidence to support it in the 60s. And he found that sea stars, by eating uh, large mussels that are competitive dominants and bullies, actually facilitate other animals uh, living in the rocky intertidal. And without sea stars, mussels take over and biodiversity goes down. With sea stars, biodiversity goes up. So we wanted to test whether or not this was true for highly stressed uh, rocky shores in Argentina along the Roaring Forties. Most of Bob's work was done in temperate rainforests where there was a very uh, mitigated desiccation stress because there was a lot of mist and fog on those shorelines. So we went down there and were completely surprised. Uh, there was, we didn't find any big sea stars. There was a carpet of mussels all over the rocky shore. You can see behind me that there is a desert. It was incredibly desiccating. And we didn't find anything. So like any good rocky shore ecologist, we brought out our ice scrapers and we started doing disturbance experiments. And when we did that, that's when we found all the different organisms uh, that we expected to find in the ecosystem, except they were tiny. It was a mini-me world. And the, inside this muscle condo, the muscles were only an inch long or so. 
We found all the species that you typically find in a rocky intertidal down here. You can see they're only an inch long. And we found chitons and sea stars and snails all living within the muscle matrix. And within a few moments of pulling them out, they started to desiccate and dry up. Um, and so we, based on these observations, we went back to our hotel there in Patagonia, had some keel mace and um, some mate, and started to think about what was our research question. And we came up with this. We thought that those muscles, instead of suppressing biodiversity, were critical to its recovery and persistence in time. And so we asked, what is the relative importance of predation and direct facilitation in controlling biodiversity, recovery, and physically stressed systems? We did this with experiments, and over a three-year period, we cleared areas and we kept them blank. We cleared areas and, and put cages up, and we did cage controls, and we did uh, mimics of mussels as far as rocks. And we looked at how biodiversity changed over time. And here's what we found. Along the x-axis are the treatments, bare rock, cage, cage control, cage plus shade, cage plus rocks, and cage plus mussels. Species rich, and this is here on the left, and around 24 species per meter squared is typically what we would find in our observations. The black bars are low intertidal. Uh, high intertidal is the um, open bars, and those are typically less stressful. So you see in the bear zone after three years, hardly any uh, species recovery has taken place um, relative to 24 as what we expected. Uh, if you exclude predators, you find just a slight effect of predator exclusion in the high zone, but that can be explained by the cage control. So no effect of predators, unlike Bob Payne found before. What we do find is a huge effect of mussels on this last bar on the right, and we see that with mussels present, that recovery of the community is almost complete after three years. And these mussels indeed, if you look at mussel mimics, what they're doing is they're mitigating desiccation stress. It's so windy on average, 45 to 50 kilometers per hour there. And these mussels act like sponges, and they allow the biodiversity to recover after disturbance. So facilitation of biodiversity is generated by positive rather than negative interactions in this environment. Well, this was published, and Bob, saying, Bob Payne said, I don't believe you at all. There's no way that sea stars aren't important. Um, and under high physical stress, they should be just as important. So let's go down there and check it out, Brian. And we made a trip. Bob came down there with Peter Creva, with a, a, a big crew of people, all those scientists involved in Argentina. We went down the coast, um, and it was just a joy. It was great. And, and Bob, uh, we got there, took five hours to drive to the site, and Bob got down on his hands and knees, and at that time his, his vision wasn't very good. Um, and uh, spent 15, 20 minutes crawling on his hands and knees down to the intertidal looking for these sea stars uh, and only found those mini-me sea stars in the environment. He said, Brian, well, I believe you, it's probably just in this site, but it looks under, like under high physical stress that positive interactions are more important than these negative ones. So that was a fun little story to share. Another example comes from Argentina on the other side of the South American coast, and this is experiments we did looking at recovery of salt marsh grasses, these long, tall sedges, uh, after drought disturbance. And what we found was that there was a critical positive interaction that was paramount to recovery of these plants. If you look down here at the bottom, these plants without neighbors, this is a Spartina species, doesn't grow very well, and that's because this crab over here has access to it. It's not blocked. That's its favorite. This tall plant is its favorite one to eat. The small succulent, they don't like to eat it. So when it's not protected by a donut of the succulent plant, it doesn't do very well. If you plant these plants inside the succulent ring, uh, you find a strong positive interaction where um, there is interspecific facilitation. And so what we found that critical to this ecosystem's recovery is interspecific facilitation. If you plant these plants out there by themselves and not protected by another species of plants, they will get eaten and ecosystem recovery will be suppressed. So it's not just direct facilitation where there's not a feedback. We know there's also strong feedbacks from these interactions between species A and B that can lead to even higher growth rates and recovery rates. And I'm gonna give you those examples in the context of our research again in salt marshes in the southeastern United States. And over the past 15 years, um, what has happened is that like most ecosystems, mangroves, coral reefs, and seagrasses, salt marshes are experiencing increased and more extensive die-off. And we now know that there's two forces that primarily lead to this in salt marshes, extensive drought, and at times interacting with overfishing, which triggers runaway grazing by snails and crabs that cue in on these drought-weakened plants to lead to these large die-off areas that you have here. And so we've asked, what are the 
key species interactions that regulate the recovery of these ecosystems. And what we found is, is, is pretty exciting, um, and I think those lessons can be transferred to other ecosystems. We found first that interest-specific mutualisms are critically important to the recovery of these systems. And we found that plants planted with neighbors do much better than planted uh, by themselves. And this is because plants in clumps um, can deal better with the intense low oxygen stress that occurs in saturated soils. When wetland plants are dealing with saturated soils, they shun oxygen from above ground plant tissue to below ground and straw-like um, plant structures, and they're not completely efficient with that. The oxygen gets down to their roots and then it leaks out the roots across the gradient. And so a lot of the oxygen is wasted. But with they're in a, a clump like this, that oxygen that's lost out of the roots can be taken up by their neighbors. And so they have less oxygen stress when they're in groups, and you can see it doubles or, or triples their growth rate when they're planted in clumps. So we found that when we're uh, restoring these ecosystems or we look at their natural re regrowth, we find they do better um, when they're planted close to each other as opposed to being planted plantation style apart. Now, we also found that an interspecific mutualism that is not within the same species is critically important and essential for this ecosystem not to turn into an alternate stable state like happens in coral reefs. We found, what we found is these over 250,000 acres of salt marshes died out for the last 10 to 15 years, but most of it has recovered. So we're asked, how is it recovering and not turning into an alternate stable state? Well, we went into these patches, and Christine Angelini led this effort, and she found that 98% of the surviving grasses within these die-off areas were associated with this muscle mound, this rib muscle here. And in those muscle mounds, that was like a, a, a luxurious hotel for the grass. They had extra nutrients because of the feces, the, the pseudo feces the mussels were planting. They were like tree fertilizer stakes. They were also spots with high drainage, so drought impacts were lowered there. There were lower salinities than you might expect in an area without mussels. And there were also mussels, harbored predators that would eat grazers that would come by. So it was a great spot to be. Uh, and if you look down here in above ground biomass, it's almost twice as high in areas with mussels as compared to areas without mussels. And what we found was, if you then, after the drought goes by and you've had this large die-off, how does recovery occur? That we found that most of the recovery occurs on the edge of these muscle mound areas, and that um, if you look at model projections, and we look at the, relative, the relationship between die-off size on the x-axis here and years to recover on the y-axis, that with muscles, the system recovers um, over a 10-year period, no matter how big the die-off size is. And that's because these muscle mounds serve as a nucleating area where regrowth occurs in relation to this, uh, the uh, edge to area ratio is very high here. So plants are using rhizomes to grow in. Without muscles, we have bare die-off areas. And then with increasing die-off size, we see that it takes almost 100 years to recovery. And because our droughts are coming every 20 years or so, what this means is that without muscles, this, this system would slip into an alternate stable state. So muscles are critical for avoiding a phase shift in the system, an interspecific mutualism. So it's not just in salt marshes. This is a study uh, that I collaborated in with Jessup van der Heide uh, in seagrasses. And it's a similar situation. And I think it's one of the most interesting findings in a while. Um, basically showed that Seagrass productivity increases throughout the world because of a tripartite mutualism with clams. These clams have very interesting bacteria that live on their gills that eat sulfides that otherwise are toxic to seagrasses. And they get up, these sulfides in anoxic sediments can build up to high levels that can kill the seagrasses. People for a long time had wondered how seagrasses can even occur in the tropics where it's so warm that sulfides should kill them, like they do in lab studies. Well, it's these clams that allow them to persist. And these clams can increase productivity. This is a relationship between clam density and seagrass biomass. You can see that it goes up almost 100% with increasing clam density. And what we found in some experiments in the, in the lab is that um, the presence of clams, uh, clams makes a huge difference for poor water sulfide. If you look at this graph, uh, poor water sulfide on the y-axis and on the x-axis is the three factors that we manipulated, but just look down here at the lower of peas, which is the clam, 
That's its present in these four and not in these four treatments. And you can see that you just can't detect sulfites when the clams are present. And that's because they're farming this bacteria on their gills and they're getting rid of the sulfite in the process. And this allows seagrass barter. So the question here is, why aren't we planting seagrasses with clams in the roots? It's, it's so important, this interspecific mutualism. So like I said before, there are more than just direct positive interactions. There are indirect positive interactions that can be generated by uh, networks. A very simple network is a trophic cascade where predators can facilitate a plant or an oyster by suppressing densities of, for instance, herbivore for a plant or a mesopredator for an oyster in those environments. In our systems, where we've been studying, there's examples of trophic cascades uh, in many systems throughout the world, and I'll just give you ours. Um, the coastal wetland paradigm, this is for mangroves, uh, in many cases for seagrass, certainly for salt marshes, was generated by uh, research done by Odom Teal and Valiela and Teal in the, in the 50s and 60s. These uh, professors had come down from Yale University or interacted with Howard Odom from Yale University, and we're looking at um, energy flow in systems. And observational studies led them to conclude that grazers and consumers were unimportant in these systems. They didn't see many bites out of the plants. But they didn't do experiments to test that hypothesis. And early on, we did some experiments 15 years ago, and we manipulated the dominant grazer and salt marsh systems. And we found that it, uh, instead of being under strong, only under bottom-up control, these systems were like Serengeti plains and coral reefs, uh, under strong control from consumers, the top down, and the bottom up. And you can see here, and if you exclude grazers, uh, this is a natural march on the left in that cage, and on the right, if you exclude razors, that's the response you get. So the, you can see the strong top-down control in the system. Uh, and they did that through fungal farming and facilitating disease. These snails did, and we subsequently have found that throughout the world, but it's mostly crabs instead of snails. We then looked at the next trophic level using experiments, and we've done this in many sites throughout the world, and we found that predators these snails are, and crabs that are grazers in the salt marsh are like popcorn for most of the predators that come in at high tide. And these predators, by suppressing densities of these snails and crabs, indirectly facilitate and create a huge positive effect on salt marsh plants. So without predators, you can get outbreaks and a die-off of these salt marsh systems and formation of grazer fronts like you see on the right side. This is a, a picture of a high-density snail photo. Uh, this front can be 300 meters long, and it's mowing through a marsh after a drought. And above there, if you exclude those snails, you can see that the grass is just fine. So indeed, it is top-down control interacting with drought, driving these die-offs in these systems. And so we found that predators are critically important in suppressing this negative interaction in the system. Another um, indirect positive interaction that we've um, call attention to in ecology with our experiments are um, a habitat or facilitation cascade. And this is not a double negative interaction leading to a strong positive interaction, but a double positive one. And we found this to be the case, and I'll show in a slide, that it is going on throughout the world in all different ecosystems. In this first experimental demonstration in 2007, we found that along these rocky shores, in Rhode Island that are continually turned over by waves, that a community cannot develop until Spartina grass first colonizes and its roots pin down those cobble beaches. Those cobbles can no longer turn over and roll over, and then once that happens, these rib mussels that we've seen before colonize on the roots of these Spartina plants. And with their colonization, a hard substrate reemerges, but it's not going to move now like the cobbles did before. And then barnacles attach there, algae attaches there, all kinds of, of different marine organisms come up from the subtitle. And what we found is that this marsh, this doesn't happen without an obligate sequence of positive interactions. Marsh grasses must be there first. They facilitate mussels. Without the mussels, we don't get the biodiversity. So you have to have that strong, uh, sequence of events leading to a synergistic positive interaction. And what we called this was a primary foundation species, um, a foundation species that through its large presence mitigates positive, um, stressors in the environment, physical stress, sunlight in this case, or predators, or cobbles moving, uh, facilitates a secondary foundation species, one that creates habitat but can't live without the primary one. And those two sequences then generate biodiversity. For instance, a tree and an epiphyte would be another example. 
so we clearly have an understanding of, of that positive interactions can be important, but do we have a predictive understanding? When and where are they important? And I'll give a few slides, and the answer is yes, we do, and we've been testing for that over the past 15 to 20 years. And the answer is, in a very simple, straightforward way, is that positive interactions are incredibly important, especially in ecosystems that are under high physical stress. This is something we've seen that's consistent across all ecosystems. So here's a qualitative example, and, and this is just rehashing what we talked about before, is that um, positive interactions in rocky intertidals become more and more important under increasing climate stress for maintaining biodiversity. If this suggests, if you do a comparative study, that under high stressful systems, mussels rather than sea stars would be critically important to preserve to maintain biodiversity in that system. But that's just qualitative. Can we get, can we go across systems and be quantitative? Well, there is a conceptual model for, that predicts this. Um, this is a stress gradient hypothesis presented by Bertness and Callaway in 1994, and it suggests that the relative importance on the y-axis of positive interactions, a positive species interactions to regulating biodiversity, community structure, and restoration of ecosystems should increase with increasing physical stress in that system. Now, this is a, a, an idea and a theory presented that has now been tested in over a thousand different studies in ecology. And it's a theory that not only for ecological systems, but anthropologists have this story as well, an idea that increasing physical stress will lead to increased cooperation among humans, and economists see this as well. So it's, it, it is potentially a general theory across many, many systems. Um, here is a meta-analysis results that have looked at over 200 of these studies that looked at the net effect of having neighbors present um, under stress and not stress. So let me explain this. This is the effect size on the y-axis. Above the zero means that it's a positive interaction with the neighbor. Below zero is a negative interaction with the neighbor of competition. On the y on the x-axis is stress duration, so it's increasing stress duration. And then here we have open and closed circles. Open circle is uh, low stress, and um, the closed circle is high stress. And we can see as we do high stress for each one of those cases, we see an increasing uh, positive interaction between the organisms. And as we increase stress duration, we see that all the interactions are positive with the neighbors. And so this provides very strong support for the stress gradient hypothesis in that as environmental stress increases in ecosystem, and this is across terrestrial and marine systems, algae versus trees versus plants, that we see strong support for this. And to go back, we've also seen generality for this important, uh, what we think is an important interaction between habitats, habitat cascades. And there's examples of these in almost every ecosystem. Um, you know about the one with salt marshes and mussels and barnacles and other biodiversity, but there's seagrasses facilitating seaweeds that facilitate marine organisms. There's trees and mistletoe or epiphytes throughout the tropics, and those mistletoe or epiphytes can, can regulate almost 50 to 60 percent of the biodiversity in tropical rainforests. And then we also have plants that facilitate algal filaments and that facilitate snails. So it, there are many, many examples of this. And what we found is that we tested when are these habitat cascades most important, and we found they're most important in transitional, stressful transitional zones. So we look at, this is effect size, and this tells you the effect of facilitating biodiversity. And what we found is that habitat cascades are most important in this, on this red dot, the transitional communities. These are the uh, ecotones. This is as you transition from a rainforest to a grassland, a sea grouse to a mud flat, as that these habitat cascades, these strong positive interactions are critically important for biodiversity maintaining itself locally as the system is under stress in those environments. So those are some examples. Everybody has those uh, from their system of where positive interactions are really important. Critically, they, without these positive interactions, many systems fall into phase shift changes and they lose their biodiversity. So if we systematically ex ex expand the conservation paradigm and restoration program to incorporate positive interaction species as well, so when we sit down, we don't just say, what are the negative forces we need to get rid of and what are the, we need to additionally say positive, forces to incorporate, will that change that? Well, we've put up a few conceptual papers, and a few more have come out recently about 
outlining how we would do that systematically. If you're interested in corals, for instance, down here, let's list the nine different intera positive interactions that we know about that we could incorporate. So we've put some conceptual papers out, and recently we asked whether or not those conceptual papers are influencing the field. And it um, doesn't look like they are too much. Um, is anyone reading the papers? Uh, maybe not. Uh, we did a global synthesis reveals gaps in coastal habitat restoration research. Only 3% of all restoration studies in our data set specifically tested for the impacts of incorporating positive species interactions into restoration designs. In those areas. So this got us thinking, and we, we published this in 2018, but we had the data well before that. And we started doing research, and we're like, well, maybe we really need to do test whether or not these positive interactions would be important in a restoration project. We see that in natural ecology studies. What about in restoration projects? So we wanted to do that. That's the next step in the story. Uh, if they work, um, how do we integrate those, and how do we upscale? Working with managers and their ideas of, of what's going on specifically at their site. So the first test we did was in the Netherlands and Florida, and I went right back to salt marsh. You just got to go with what you know. Um, we worked with the Boy Scouts in Florida and the Netherlands with uh, big restoration groups, and we simply did this. We said, okay, the restoration paradigm here, and we surveyed over 100 agencies, and all these agencies plant salt marshes in dispersed designs where they plant these propagules away from each other to avoid competition and the potential for a negative species interaction. Our research suggested that instead you should plant them in clumps, and so we controlled for density. We had six plants to put out in a meter squared. We either put them together or disperse them, and the dispersion, again, is the current paradigm, and this is done all over the world. And we look for the effects. So there's no difference in density or the amount of conservation uh, investment, just the change in design. Uh, and we got really strong results from these plantings. What we found, if we look here on this graph, um, is that the black bars are clumped and the open bars are dispersed. Up here on the left side, Florida is on the left two graphs and results from the Netherlands on the right two graphs. On the y-axis is biomass down here, and then we have survivorship. So how well are these plants doing? Uh, and then on the x-axis, we have low and high elevation. So we did this across a stress gradient, with low elevation being the most stressful for marsh plants because there's less oxygen in the soil. So if you break this down, what you see is uh, in most of the situations where clump versus disperse can do up to 300% greater, this is with no extra resource, and grow that much faster when plants are together rather than dispersed. In Florida, for instance, in biomass, this happens in the low zone and the high zone. You can see that there's less of a positive effect when they're together in the high zone where there's less stress, but it's still better to be clumped. The same goes for um, the Netherlands when we look at survivorship, uh, but there's a slight change. The survivorship only increases with clumping in the low, but not the high. And if you look at biomass, this is really interesting in the Netherlands. You look down here, we get an inter a significant interaction. And I know it's very small, but what you can see is clumping um, is a positive effect on the plants in the low zone, but under, high uh, under low physical stress in the high zone where there's less flooding, it's actually better for the plants to be dispersed. And so from that, we came up with a conceptual model of how marsh plantings we think should be changed to incorporate positive interactions uh, under our stressful conditions. And here that is, is that it, Planting marshes in the low intertidal should take uh, switch from a dispersed to a clump, the same in the mid intertidal. And in a high intertidal where there's less flooding and less physical stress, they should be planted as they currently are in dispersed forms. And this will maximize growth rates in those areas. So that's what we propose. This, another, uh, this is just the second example I want to give uh, of two. And I think this is one of the most um, Wow, interesting results in all of ecology in the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, Dr. Kirsten Lawson is a, is a part of this, um, who's collaborating now in California, and Brent Hughes led this effort. Um, and so this is a story about seagrass recovery in Elkhorn Slough. And this graph right here shows, if you look, it's nitrogen loading rate um, and on the x-axis and on the y-axis, seagrass bed aerial change. Um, and this graph, if you just look at the black dots, it shows us that as nitrogen loading increases, we get an exponential decay in the amount of seagrasses, and then about around 100 or 200 um, 
kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, that's when seagrasses disappear. And I was taught and many others in marine ecology that there was a very consistent threshold for seagrasses and that with high nutrients in those systems, they will be, that will fuel algal growth and lead to uh, decimation of seagrasses and the formation of an alternate stable state where those high nutrients will prevent seagrasses from coming back and that we'll have to push the nitrogen loading rate way down low for seagrasses to come back. And that could cost hundreds of millions of dollars like they've been doing in the Chesapeake Bay. And, and I might add successfully so in the last five years, it's taken 30 or four years, they've reduced it. But now let me draw your attention to um, this red dot up here. This is Elkhorn Slough, one of the most polluted uh, as far as nitrogen estuaries in, on the west coast of the United States, super high nitrogen loads that are even higher now. And it also has one of the greatest expansion rates of seagrasses that's occurring currently. And so how does this conundrum occur? Brent Hughes um, discovered uh, with his colleagues that this was through uh, facilitation through a network of trophic interactions. Sea otters have recently expanded into these systems and they're voracious predators, eat 25% of their weight uh, in one day. They have eaten a lot of crabs and the crabs eat sea slugs. So when the sea otters come in, sea slugs bloom up and these are three to four inches long and they go up and down these seagrass blades all day and they eat any algae that comes into the seagrass bed. So with otter expansion into these areas, and you see otters are covered. Look at all the ulva here. Despite all this ulva in the estuary, seagrasses are persisting and that's because they have these vacuum cleaners on them. Um, and this is an amazing story. I didn't really believe it. I was, uh, I, I flew out there to see this and Brent took me out there and there were the most luxuriant seagrasses I've ever seen, six, seven feet tall in the most polluted water. So here this overturned everything I've been taught about how seagrasses cannot coexist with high nitrogen loading. And the reason they could is because a positive interaction had been reactivated in this area because of the expansion of sea otters into it. So this gets, then brings us to the Linfest Ocean Program. If we uh, more systematically test whether or not these intra and interspecific interactions can increase restoration success, what will we find? And can this change the trajectory of, of, of marine restoration? Marine restoration is, is garnering uh, increased interest from all, almost all conservation organizations and researchers. And can we add this to our list of conservation interventions um, to really help these ecosystems recover at large spatial scales? We know we can do it at small scales, but can restoration work at large spatial scales consistently across habitats? So the project goals for this LINFEST program are first to test whether taking advantage of natural partnerships between organisms that occur in ecosystems, like I explained, can increase wetland recovery rates and reduce planning costs through a shared discovery investigation. This is working uh, consistently with um, managers. So this is not our team going in and just doing our own projects, but working with managers to figure out what questions need to be answered, what species need to be worked with, and going over what are these positive interactions that occur in your system and what do we think are the most powerful ones that we should try to incorporate by design. Um, and then communicate progress and results to managers, policymakers, and restoration practitioners like we're doing right now. So there's multiple collaborators. We're doing this in four spots. It's four spots, California, North Carolina, in salt marsh and oyster habitats, the Netherlands and Denmark, as well as in China. Um, here's a map. So this is going on throughout the world in many of these areas. Um, and what we're doing consistently in each one of these spots, which we haven't done before, is that we're crossing intraspecific facilitation, so clumping versus dispersed of marsh plants or seagrasses with the presence or absence of intraspecific mutualism. And this could be the mutualism is either a, the presence of a bivalve or the presence of a predator that can generate a trophic cascade in those areas. So that's what we're doing in each one of those sites. And we're working with marshes and oyster reefs because we know the most about them and have most connections there. But it, we really think that they're generalizable for tropical systems as well. So here's what we're doing in China. And these are large areas in, in China that have been decimated because of the interactions between drought and grazing, just like in southeastern United States. And there's been difficulty in, the re, in generating regrowth in these systems. It's thought to be an ultimate stable state. So what we're doing is we're planting uh, plants in clump versus dispersed designs 
with and without um, uh, grazers there to mimic predators. And we're also doing this in areas that have natural crab predators, and those uh, are the grazers that are hitting these plants, um, and those predators are cranes. So we're doing this uh, clumping and dispersed with and without predators and clumping dispersed with and without predator exclusion mimics. And um, so far we found big effects of clumping, but only when crabs are um, excluded from the area. So the managers are really interested in upscaling this how do we keep these crabs out and mimic predators over large spatial scale? So right now, uh, Dr. Dr. Kuhi is coming up with ideas and we're putting in large pitfall traps and long line exclusion cages to keep crabs out of these areas uh, to mimic the positive interactions of having predators in the area. So there's an example of how we're trying to upscale the results, positive results we're finding so far. Um, in North Carolina, we're doing uh, two different intra versus inter-specific facilitation experiments, first with clams and seagrasses. So we're planting seagrasses in clumps or dispersed designs with and without clam presence. And so far we found a, big, a smaller effect of clumping, and clumping facilitates things, but a huge effect of clams. And with clams, you can see there's almost a threefold increase in seagrass growth and expansion rates are tremendous, whether you do this with seedlings or uh, uh, small propagules. So, a positive interactions could be critically, critically important for seagrass restoration. Um, this is what these results are telling us so far. Um, we're also looking at um, oyster reef spartina interactions, and we're going to plant um, salt marshes and restore salt marshes along the shoreline in clump versus dispersed designs with and without oyster reef, and that's going to begin uh, this spring. Okay, in California, this is a, a project um, that's spearheaded by Dr. Kirsten Wasson and Monique Fountain. Um, it's really a, just an amazing place to be and what they've done with this estuary. This is a $4 million grant that they got. Um, they're restoring a large, large area of the salt marsh and returning it to the marsh. It was previously farmland. This involves major excavation. And Kirsten had the really interesting idea we've been communicating together and um, thinking about positive interactions of just restoring all the plants that she's going to put back there in uniform versus clustered designs over large spatial scales and plant those across an elevation gradient uh, about 30 centimeters in difference to see if uh, uniform versus clustered plants grow better, uh, whether they persist and whether they cover this larger area um, um, over a shorter time period. So we'll be testing that. And she's doing that with seven different species uh, in this marsh. And here's an example of the setup with the California Conservation Corps that, uh, that occurred this January. Um, we're also at this site going to do separate experiments to look at clump versus dispersed designs and facilitating plant regrowth with and without sea otters present and with and without um, raptors present. So we'll be doing intra versus inter specific facilitation there as well. And in uh, the Netherlands, working with Dr. Jesse uh, van der Heide and Dr. Va Johan van der Koppel, we're looking at uh, whether or not the presence of uh, clumped versus dispersed seagrasses uh, versus the presence and absence of muscle bed mimics can help seagrass recovery and the relative importance of those two positive interactions. So we're, we're planting seagrasses without a muscle bed that helps mitigate wave stress in those areas and stabilize and uh, we're planting them in clump dispersed without a muscle bed, and then we're clumping dispersing them with muscle beds present. Um, and we don't know the results of that yet, but we're very hopeful. Um, we've seen positive effects of clumping so far. So the conclusions and the next steps. Um, the original results that we've had from our small-scale experiments that weren't in restoration projects suggest that if we incorporate cooperation and positive interactions, mutualisms, facilitations, small scale, large scale, indirect interactions, we could as much double the success rate of coastal restoration with little added cost. It just takes extra time and planning, systematically listing all the positive interactions that we can incorporate and thinking about new designs to do that. So the next steps in this project timeline is from um, 2018 to 2021, and we'll be monitoring these sites for uh, many years to come. Um, we will be setting up more experiments and taking advantage of, of new insights. We will produce peer-reviewed studies and communication summaries that will be um, available in open access journals. Um, we will share preliminary results in webinars like we're doing now. 
Um, and I'm available as well as uh, the team here for feedback on design of restoration projects. I'm doing that right now in Australia. And so, um, for instance, with an oyster project that's going on here, and with an hour or two of discussion, we've tweaked a little bit to uh, test the relative importance of incorporating intra versus interspecific facilitation, which could change the trajectory and success of that restoration project. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank the, the Linfest uh, Foundation for their support here, the um, Ocean Program, for their support, Emily Knight, especially for helping me put this webinar together. Uh, and really, um, for everybody to understand, this is a, this is a major team effort, a, a big collaboration, and, and it's fun to do this. The share, it's a shared discovery and investigation process with all these collaborators at all these sites, Linfest Ocean Program and the, and the Silliman Lab. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Brian, that was great. And we do have a few minutes for questions and we've had a couple come in, um, so we'll, we'll start with that. So the, for our first question, uh, for, the, for the seagrasses example with mussels, is there a threshold of this intra or interspecific mutualism when the interaction moves from positive to negative and inhibits recovery? How can a manager understand where their system lies in this spectrum? Right. Um, that is incredibly insightful, and that's what we have to get to. We have to understand um, under the typical stress gradient for that system, for instance, uh, with seagrasses, the nutrient, system, the nutrient stress gradient, or with salt marsh grasses, the oxygen one. So at what point do you stop planting these plants together and then planting them in the dispersed design. And the way to figure that out is with experiments at your sites. And those experiments are, are not too difficult to do. And you can see the results pretty clearly. We saw, I mean, I did statistics, but you could just see them with your eyes. If, if, if you plant them in clumps up high versus dispersed, what you see in clump ones, they do worse. And at the mid and low, they do better. And so there is gonna be some site-specific understanding and experiments that are important here. But that's what we do in ecology anyways. Coral reef managers don't um, understand that certain parrotfish are more important, species are more important, depending on where you are. Batfish are really important in the Pacific. And so some natural history understanding and some experiments are gonna be critically important. But you're right, we don't wanna just go out there and change design completely and clump these plants and mangroves up and down the intertidal zone. We know that we wanna clump them down low, for sure and we want to disperse them up high. But where we, we do that in between, we need to test with experiments. Cool, thank you. Uh, we have another question here. Are there grazers in the Chesapeake that play a similar role as those in Elkhorn Slough? Chesapeake predators that are analogous to sea otters, can sighting of shellfish aquaculture facilitate vegetative restoration? Okay, two different questions. This, these are really interesting. So um, I don't think it's as well worked out in the Chesapeake Bay. Certainly it's well worked out that um, the epiphyte grazers are critically important, like the small amphipods for facilitating seagrass there in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, increased diversity of those amphipods and isopods uh, leads to greater control of epiphytes on those seagrasses. Um, and then there's hypotheses that, um, for instance, penfish could be eating a lot of those amphipods and that predators such as um, striped bass that eat the penfish and that eat the blue crabs that eat the amphipods facilitate them. So that could be there as well. And that could be really, really important. That needs to be tested. Uh, and I don't think that has in a rigorous way, like manipulating penfish in those seagrass beds. Um, the other one about aquaculture and clams, and, and this goes back to the first question. Okay, we have examples of that clams and bivalves are critically important to these plants in seagrasses and salt marsh systems. But when and where is that important? We, we in generally know it's gonna be important under stressful conditions, but with seagrasses, um, what I am hearing from other researchers, and this is probably gonna be coming out in the next two to three years, is that bivalves in general in the, in the roots really help them out, and that aquaculture facilities uh, can help uh, facilitate seagrasses under different conditions uh, and vice versa. And there may be something to do with the degree of overlap. In other words, uh, oyster aquaculture right next to them 
seagrasses will do well, maybe not right underneath them. There might be some shading that occurs. So there might be some, a spatial component where oyster reefs facilitate, natural oyster reefs may facilitate seagrasses if they're 50 or 60 feet away, but if they're right next to the oyster reefs, they may not because of sedimentation problems. So I imagine a lot of these positive interactions, I think with the bivalves are gonna be spatially dependent from what I'm hearing and need to happen at a larger distance apart. Thank you for that. Um, we have another question here. What is the mechanism by which clams enhance the growth of seagrasses? Um, that's a great question. We don't know that yet. Um, I'm not sure these clams that we use have the symbiotic bacteria on their gills that would um, lead to decreased sulfide production, um, or it's, it could be certainly increased nitrogen availability uh, or both, but uh, that remains to be investigated. When we studied this with mussels in Spartina marshes, we were looking for one thing that the mussels did, and we found that they reduced salinity, they reduced sulfides, they increased nitrogen concentration, Christine Angelini did, and that um, they also harbored predators that kill the grazers. So there's four or five different factors that they uh, uh, had po ways, pathways that had positive effects. So we have not um, figured that out. Another way could be stabilizing soil. I don't know, um, but that remains to be investigated. Thanks, and we'll take just one more question here. Um, it, first of all, it starts with, thank you so much for the webinar. Um, and then can you give some examples of positive interactions in coral reef systems? Also, do you know if mimic strategies have been used to reduce predation on corals? For example, crown of thorn starfish. Right, so um, this is really interesting. So we all know about herbivores. They could facilitate corals um, by suppression of algae. A recent study just came out in Nature Ecology and Evolution with Mark Hay as the senior author and one of his graduate students that showed that planting um, corals, outplanting corals in diverse, so if you have five corals you're putting in a meter square, if they're all different species versus a monoculture, the polyculture grows better. They don't know the mechanisms they suggested because that's a diversity of chemical defenses, um, less competition. Uh, but there could be a positive interaction there by um, taking advantage of different types of chemical defenses to algae that different corals have. So there's enough, that's an interspecific facilitation uh, that could be really important. Um, planting corals next to seagrasses and mangroves where there's less sediment coming out could be critically important. And so the other one, the crown of thorn sea stars, what we found with salt marshes and seagrasses and mangroves is, may be the case there that in areas where you do already have predators or where they're emerging, um, they can naturally suppress outbreaks of these very potent grazers. We have consumer fronts just like coral reefs though, and salt marshes, and those are generated by physical stressors interacting with less predators in the area. So crown of thorn sea stores is probably physical and top down as well. And I imagine that um, taking advantage of areas with predators, so on the edges of marine protected areas where predators are naturally occurring in higher densities, you may find that restoring coral reefs on the edges and having them grow out could be more important. Another one could be um, size dependent with corals that we're thinking about. And that paper, I can send that out again, we've listed all these. Another one is planting corals, small corals around a large coral. So a large coral can provide a variety of, chem of defenses, uh, positive interactions that can dissipate wave stress. It can harbor grazers and those grazers can come out and clean the corals at night. It can also harbor predators that can eat snails. So um, there's examples like this. In the Caribbean, we're looking at whether or not lobsters can facilitate corals by eating um, uh, snails, that those Dracula snails that, that, that devour many of the restored corals. So we're looking for a trophic cascade there, which again could, could mean the difference in restoration being successful or being a failure. Great, thank you so much, uh, Brian, and thank you for those who submitted questions. Uh, we couldn't get through everything, but we did capture them all. And again, uh, please do follow up with us. We will also share the, the link when this recording is up online. Um, and thank you again, Brian, so much for doing this. This was, a, this was a great webinar, and I am going to end the meeting now. <laughs> 
Thank you. All right. Bye-bye, everybody.